You're listening to the 40 Thrive Podcast, Episode 3. You're listening to the 40 Thrive Podcast, the show created for women 40 and beyond, ready to shake things up. Get exclusive access to expert advice, support, and strategies that will inspire, motivate, and give you the tools to not just survive, but thrive. And now, your host, Jackie McDougall. Welcome to the 40 Thrive Podcast. I am so happy you're here. Thank you so much for listening. If you're listening to this podcast, there's a good chance you're a woman over 40 who is tired of the status quo. Maybe you feel ready to take action toward a better life, but you're not exactly sure how. This podcast has been specially created just for you. I created the 40 Thrive community because I'm dedicated to connecting women in their 40s, 50s, and 60s with the resources needed to live life on our own terms. Before we get started with today's episode, head on over to 40thrive.com and download your free tips to thriving today. There are some super helpful little nuggets in there that will support you in living a life with more intention, purpose, and fulfillment. That's 40thrive.com for your free tips to thriving today. So I recently saw an op-ed in the New York Times called Puberty for the Middle Aged. I read it, it was funny and poignant, and it definitely made me think. And then I saw it again when a friend shared. And then again, and then again. It's been shared thousands of times, clearly resonating with the over 40 crowd. So I reached out to the writer, Lisa Sellen Davis, and invited her on the podcast. She's here today. Lisa is an author and freelance writer. She's written countless articles for outlets like Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, Parenting, but it's her recent New York Times piece that's getting all the attention. In it, she compares perimenopause to puberty in a way that has people laughing, talking, sharing, and tweezing their facial hair. While I invited Lisa on to talk about the contents of the article and why it resonated so much with women over 40, it's actually the story behind the story that Lisa goes into that I think reveals a lot more than expected about women over 40. So let's just get right to it. Welcome to the 40 Thrive Podcast, Lisa Selen Davis. Thank you for having me. You've written a lot of pieces for a lot of places, as I said in your bio, but this recent piece in the New York Times really blew up. Um, I first want to know, what made you want to write about perimenopause to begin with? I was... um you know, dealing with my body in the various ways that some of us do, like the bizarre periods and just, just, just these wrestling, these kind of changes. And I belonged to a Facebook group of um, women and non-binary trans writers over 40. And I posted on there, what are some things that no one, um, ever told you about middle age. I was just thinking about like, why did, why did no one warn me about all this bizarre, bizarre stuff? And, um, and why are we not talking about it? And I wasn't intending to write anything, but then as I looked at the responses, it became clear to me that this is a, I am not alone, you know, and that um, many people were feeling the same way that there were these kind of mysteries of middle age um, that needed to be, you know, exposed. And I can't even remember how I heard the word perimenopause, but I can tell you I had not heard it till, you know, a year or two ago. And I didn't hear from my doctor. You know, I, I, it, it's, I heard it here and there um, with other women. It sort of it seeped into um, the lexicon for me. But it was fascinating to me that for the most part, even your computer will tell you it's not a word and tell you it's something spelled wrong. You know, it's so unspoken. And that's right. um, and that's and you know that's how I got the idea. Right, right. It's, it's so interesting because, you know, perimenopause, as we know, is very, very real. 
I'm constantly consulting with um, medical doctors and, and experts in different areas who will also testify that it's very, very real. I mean, I personally went into menopause at 35 because I had it surgically. Um, I had things uh -huh. removed that automatically overnight, you know, within a few hours shoved me into menopause. So that brings wow. its own um, ball of fun. But yeah. You know, many of the women our age and later are going through it slowly and painfully. I feel like in some ways they ripped the Band-Aid off for me. It's, it's, don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating that anybody should be in menopause at 35, but I will say that the support was there, that the doctor said, okay, this is where your body is. This is where it will be in a few hours. We have medication or supplements or other things that you can do to kind of help However, women who go through it naturally don't always get that kind of support. I love that you're talking about it because maybe you've, you've helped many, many women turn to their doctors and ask for support. Yeah, you know, I have a doctor's appointment next week, <laughs> next week and I've, I've, I have no idea if, if she will know that I'm the person who wrote that and, I, and if I should, uh, you know, bring it up or if it will even empower me to ask questions, um, you know, that I've long had that I've never figured out how to ask. I mean, I feel also suddenly very interested in not having my period anymore. Mm -hmm. It's so weird and so painful. And it just feels like I've had to navigate this for, you know, 30, 30, how old am I? 35 years. <laughs> Wow. And, um, and, you know, I had kids, I'm done. Um, and I remember asking her a couple of times about like birth control and her saying, you know, you're not a good kid, you're too emotional or, you know, which I had told her, but, you know, just sort of talking to me about my history. And I would, I would try to bring these subjects up about how to navigate my body and feel like they were all, um, they were just difficult to talk about, you know, I, and I, then I'm kind of excited about the possibility of, it, is it possible? Is it possible that I'm going to get a break from my period? Is that a thing? Can I do that? Uh, it's so wonderful. <laughs> well, I will, I will attest to the fact that it, it certainly um, helps you not think about, I never think about what I'm doing and what time of the month I'm doing it and what may happen. So it's been so long since I had to think like that. That is a little bit freeing. and. Yeah. And, you know, no birth control. So that's a little bit, a lot bit yeah. freeing. Um, so those are, you know, I think that there are pros and cons to everything. Um, but I want to read a little bit of your piece because this is the part that made me um, crack up. So here's what's going to happen. Eventually your pubic hair is going to thin out everywhere, but on the bikini line, exactly the opposite of what you've always wanted. The fat on your body will redistribute so that each of your thighs is the shape of Grimace, the McDonald's blob monster. You will develop those wings of loose skin below your arms. You just will, no matter what you do. Also, everything about your periods will change. They may become shorter, more frequent, more painful, and they'll just get weirder until they desist. That sounds so fun. <laughs> so is that based on yeah. your personal experience or from what you've gotten from other people? Honestly, the truth is that my thighs were always kind of shaped like Grimace, so I just <laughs> stole that... Um, joke from myself and the pubic hair was entirely stolen from this post that I, that I guess at some point we'll go into that ended up yes. getting me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, that joke was stolen and the periods are my God. I mean, I, I had plenty to mine from my own life. Um, right. Guess, but, but I, I also remember like when I discovered that my arms had gotten chubby a few years ago, mm -hmm. I was just like, wait, what, what happened? Why are my, why are my arms shaped like my thighs now? Why do I have grimace arms too? And uh, <laughs> grimace everywhere. I noticed, I noticed they, um, they put up a letter to the editor of some people were really offended. I mean, someone's always going to be offended, but some people were offended by the idea of calling it puberty and felt like it was, you know, um, 
talking down to women. Although I did notice some people said that and they hadn't actually read it because I thought, oh, well, it's pretty funny. So you could, you could read it before you decide to be offended. Um, but well, that is a phenomenon. Said, that is a phenomenon. Yeah. People reading headlines and being offended before they've yeah. actually read the story. Yes, it, it makes this, this job, this writer job a lot harder. But um, just because you get people so angry without really having an understanding of what they're angry about. But um, anyway, this one person was kind of said, the letter that they published said something about, you know, this is so offensive, I'm aging beautifully. You know, <laughs> this, this lady needs to go to the gym. And I, you know, I do go to the gym. And some of the, some of what's happening to my body is just my genetic map. You know, I'm bound. I am. Um, my kids call me blobby butt, and I'm not. I'm not an overweight person, but it's just. It is sort of. I think even if I worked out all the time, I might. This is going to be how I age, and uh, some some women are. You know, have high muscle tone and um, fulfill. Um, you know, a, a match our stereotypes of what's attractive, and you know, for many years into. Um, latter life and um, I so I wasn't I wasn't trying to be offensive or suggest that everybody ages badly but I do tend to take things that I am ashamed of and uh, that people don't talk about and try to broadcast them as loud and far as possible that's just the way I deal with shame. Right, right. I well, mean, I, then, I, then I end up bringing lots of shame on myself for it. But hey, it's, <laughs> it's an imperfect system. <laughs> so, you know, but what I, what I liked about your piece is that you talked about all the what one could perceive as negatives, but you also talked about that we get more comfortable with ourselves and that there are studies that show that people get happier as they grow older. Maybe you care a little bit less about certain things. So I want to give people a little bit of the backstory. So while you are writing about caring less over 40 and beyond or perimenopause and beyond, there's a whole mess going on behind the scenes. Can you give us a little bit of the backstory of there? Yeah. So the group that I posted this original query in, again, not, not because I wanted to write something, just it, it was a group of very, very supportive wonderful group. It felt like this real haven on the internet. And I loved it. And, um, but I am a writer and I do um, get ideas from everything around me, you know, and I decided that I should write something because it just seemed like, oh, I've, I've hit on something. So it did not. So people wrote zillions of comments on there and some of them were deeply personal but I wasn't actually paying attention to those I was looking at the ones about like pubic hair and um or you know learning to can we we can swear it's a podcast yes, right yes <laughs> but learning you know the the learning to not give a fuck I was looking at these more generic sort of patterns um and I I decided to write this op-ed and I used um I ended up using six anonymous quotes from the piece and then a couple of examples that people had given, like the pubic hair. And then thinking, you know, that this was wonderful, I told everyone, oh, I turned this into a piece. And instead of maybe contacting those six people, um, I, <laughs> because I didn't realize I, it was wrong, I just wrote, if you don't want, want me to use your quote, let me know. I decided to write something based on this. And also they were so, they're very, if you look at the piece, there's no, nobody's secrets are being told, you know, so they're, they're very generic and they were anonymous and it's a pr secret group, but I just phrased it badly. So there are, so there's a rule in the group that you can't share anything from the group out in the world. And mm -hmm. I definitely violated that, even though it didn't, I didn't think of it that way. I just thought anonymous quotes, whatever, but someone, um, put up a new post and said, you know, you can't do that. You can't, you can't trick people into participating in your article. And I felt terrible. 
and and they 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 a real mob formed you know of attacking me oh you do this all the time you put up a post about this people like looking through my social media to try to make a pattern of me doing it Mm. and I don't I only know maybe 20 of those people of those thousand people in the group in person so um it's really hard to defend yourself I I felt like technically I had I had done something wrong uh I had violated the rules I, it was such a thoughtless mistake. And I just was like, you guys, I'm so sorry. You're absolutely right. Let me get permission for the quotes. Let me tell my editor at the New York Times what I did. Let me do everything I can to make it right. And also it was going on during the Kavanaugh hearings. And it was sort of like, oh, this culture of people completely unwilling to take responsibility for their actions. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to I'm going to try to make it right and try to be forgiven, you know, because I, I want to model a different way. Um, But I was, I was not forgiven. I was banned from the group. And also the, the narrative that unfolded was that I was a duplicitous person. And what was hard about that is you, you can only think that of me. If you don't know me, I let everything hang out. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, I don't have a lot of boundaries. I'm, I say inappropriate things all the time. I get myself in trouble all the time, but it's not from tricking people, you know, and I could have just put up a new post that said, I just, I loved what we were talking about there. I want to write something about it. Does anybody have any quotes I can use? I mean, the fic, I could have, if I had just, I could have maybe not even mentioned what I was doing and maybe no one would have cared. I wasn't duplicitous. I was actually transparent, but I was transparent after the fact. I told it, if I hadn't told them, they wouldn't have known. It just was really, really sad. And a a whole bunch of people unfriended me uh, personally. And, you know, I lost this community and I also lost the community that inspired the piece. And I really went into a tailspin because I thought, first of all, I thought, what kind of world is it where you commit an infraction like that and you cannot fix it? It's, I get that, I get that um, the principle was violated, but if you look at what's in the piece, the only thing left from the piece is the puberty, the pubic hair, and maybe the thing about like, um, in the, the superpower of invisibility though, I think. Though also all of those things are just things that other people either I know about or they're in comic culture or I Googled symptoms or they're from my life or they're from a public Facebook pe- post that I wrote like soliciting quotes. Right. Because that's, I, I that's learned, not a unique I problem. My lesson. <laughs> right. It's not a unique problem. So no one's privacy was violated, but they felt violated and they attacked and they think so badly of me and then when the piece came out some of them would write on any when people posted it they would write this woman stole and she crowdsourced and tricked people they 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 couldn't let it go and they couldn't they didn't you know I replaced all the quotes and I did everything I could to salvage it because a I felt it was an important message I felt I had hit on something Mm mm-hmm Um, B, it's the New York Times. It's not like, hey, some people are mad at me in a small Facebook group that they banned me from, so take the piece down. None of none of them would have done that either, I don't think, because hey man, we're all writers. So, you know. Um what's what's fascinating the the funniest part was the number of people begrudging me for my New York Times money. So I would just I like to point out that you get hundred and fifty dollars for op ed. So anybody thinking that I got rich from that so I just went and and I even said because a lot of people were writing she took the money as if as if they had oh I'm starting to sound bitter but anyway I just said I said to anyone who wrote that you know you guys could decide in the binder of a, a charity that you would like me to donate the money to and I would be happy to donate the $150 when I get paid you know in a few months right Right. That's, that's, a, that's a whole other podcast when you uh, talk about freelance writing and when you get paid. Freelance writing. <laughs> yeah. So I, mean, anyway, my- I think I just, I just veered into anger, but I mostly was 
really sad. But but I want to talk about this for a minute because, you know, my background is in blogging. I used to be a Disney blogger. I used to blog for Huffington Post, uh, you know, and all these different outlets. And one of the things that I did regularly was crowdsource. You clearly didn't go into it looking for an article. It just kind of, sometimes you just have to be aware, wow, this, this matters to people. People are really responding to this. I should write a piece about it. But the ideal thing would have been, like you said, to reach out to these individuals and say, I like this quote, may I use it? But even if you had done that, um, I feel like there would be some sort of backlash anyway for you to even consider taking something from the group and, and bringing it out into the real world. But I think the question here, the real discussion here is when we're talking about women over 40 who are more comfortable with themselves, who um, give fewer fucks, uh, so to speak, yeah. why do you think the response was so strong? Well, some of it could be, um, you know, it is a group of writers, <laughs> famously unethical people, but, um, but they could have... Um, I think the woman who really led the charge, she, she also is very high up in a professional journalist organization. And I think she probably felt like it was just really, un- you, you, if you are posting something in this group, you are, even though it's Facebook, you are doing so with the understanding that someone's going to not uh, turn it into a piece. So I think their objection was, was so justified. I get it. I didn't realize I was doing something wrong, but I completely understand that I was. So the actual, the objection to the principle makes a lot of sense to me. What makes less sense is the mob. And also like when they kicked me out, no one even sent a note saying, look, you violated the rules and that's it. It was really, you become dehumanized. And I think I'm assuming that some of them felt like we can't trust this person. She should never see anything I put on social media. Some of that is probably worth them examining. You are in, it is social media. It's a private group. I messed up for sure. And I need to go about things differently. If I'm going to, if I crowdsource, I need to be totally clear about it and I need to check with people. And then I did, I have since then. And um, I felt it was very important for me to learn a lesson. But unfortunately, you know, one of the lessons I learned was just that the mob is unstoppable once it starts. And it is so easy to dehumanize someone on the internet. And um, it really, it really affected me. I, I, definitely considered giving up writing because I felt I again I felt like if people will attack you over something this small you know what will they do (laughs) what will they do if you make a real a bigger mistake and also um but it it also felt it felt like a real loss, even though it was a loss of a virtual community. That would have been the place where I would have been celebrating my accomplishment. And also, you know, it was an homage to them. And, and, and I'm sure that they were just, you know, in there fuming and being like, how dare she? And I tried to tell a couple of people, look, I replaced all the quotes. I checked with everyone. I got permission from everyone, but then I replaced their quotes anyway. I tried to bring people back from the ledge where they were, you know, um, the people I could see defaming me on the internet. I tried to reach out to them. And, and also the whole time I just said, I miss that group. It was wonderful. I'm terribly sorry that I violated the rules and made people feel unsafe. That is all true. So it was very hard to um, enjoy that it did well or, more importantly than it doing well was the number of people who felt seen and heard because of it, which is the real, the gift of when, when you share your shame is that many people who, who don't feel comfortable doing that um, feel better. You know, it is like the only thing I do that is a tiny bit 
in a, in a tiny way, it's a public service. You know, it's self-interested and selfish and as writing is. But, you know, it did some people good. And I wish I didn't have to make that mistake, make people feel bad and sacrifice this community. But I am glad that the message got out there. Right. I think it's really important. You know, I know that the internet is a whole other world, but for women over 40, where we have lived a lot of life, we have made a lot of mistakes, we are often raising humans who are also making lots of mistakes, Mm -hmm. that we need to take a breath. You know, when somebody screws up online and not just assume that they have these this ill will, you know, against us. And I, I see a lot of that where people are on the edge of their seats waiting to be offended so they can really respond mm. um, angrily. I understand the private group. I mean, I run a private group and there are things in there that are said that people don't want to be shared. And I completely understand yeah. and respect that. But as I tell my children... If you are to comment online or on your phone, in a text, in an email, you know, on Facebook, it is not private. I know that it's yeah. a private group. Everybody can take a screenshot at any time. To be held accountable for your mistake, sure. Maybe to even be removed from the group, okay. But to act like you came forward in a way that was meant to violate others I feel like the pendulum has swung so far in, in a, you know, that we can't, there's no room for error anymore. Well, I, that is an issue. There's no room for error. I'm in some other over 40 groups. And if I post something, they write, is this for you, for, for you to write about? Are you tricking people into writing? And then they tell and they write, she was kicked out of this group. And I wonder how much it will follow me. Um, I have made real mistakes and this is a mistake, but I've made worse mistakes than this. <laughs> and I, and I, um, just in life, you know, with actual human beings in my real world. Right. And, um, and it's interesting that it's so much harder to get forgiven for what you do on the internet than what you do in life. Interesting. And I don't even disagree with them, you know, that when they accuse me of being someone who can't really be trusted, they were accusing me of, you know, thinking that everything is material and they're right. You know, that's how I work. I'm in the middle of a conversation with someone, they're telling me something interesting and I think, oh, that's an article. It's how my, I've been doing this for, you know, 15 years or longer. And well, and that's why you're successful at it. I mean, look at comedians who stand up on stage and talk about real life and things that they notice, you know, that that's the whole point of being a freelance writer is to write about real moments and real issues and real conversations, you know, obviously not exploiting the people that you're around, but that's exactly what, why people are reading what you're writing. So I understand that. And I understand that you made that mistake, but you know, I think it's important also to you're getting forgiveness from, or you've, you have received forgiveness from people in your life when you've made mistakes, I'm sure maybe some who haven't, but, but these people online don't know you. And I think it's important for all of us to, you know, whether you're a writer or just somebody who commented on Facebook and then you have people rip into you, you know, it's it's not real in many ways. Nobody is responding in a human way. We would never respond to people like that at a party or at the neighborhood, you know, coffee shop. So why why right. are we responding in that way? It's interesting because it's not real, but it feels so real. And then you never know. I never know when people say, you know, we're gonna write this thing and expose you. If, I, I, you know, I don't know if they mean it or not. And also there's not really, in, in this case, there's not a lot to expose. I freely admit my foible, but I, um, but I think I get very confused about that. It's happening online. 
is it really happening? You know, I had this community. I don't see people during the day much. I work at home by myself and I just like retrieve my children and come back home. Mm -hmm. So these, these communities were, you know, that I mean that I kind of love them, but I also feel like human beings haven't really evolved enough to be able to handle social media. And it is interesting, the need to engage anger. I mean, it, 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 social media allowed everybody to be angry when I guess we were busy, you know, being civilized <laughs> and, and repressing it, you know, and, may, and I guess everybody had this deep seated need to, to, be, to, to unbridle their anger. And, and anger has been a problem with me my whole life. And, and I didn't, I didn't react to this angrily. I, I didn't, I didn't get, I didn't get angry back at them. I, but I also, but I, I mean, I was very scared and very remorseful. Um, but I wasn't, the one thing that I have not been good at is this whole, you know, not giving a fuck thing that, that apparently women, uh, especially are, are supposed to achieve as they get into their forties. So, you know, one of the ironic things is that I had to, I had to try to be more like that. I mean, as I was adding into the piece, like, you know, oh, these, these people are in this not giving a fuck stage of life, which of course we couldn't print in the time. I right. can't remember what we ended up with, but they don't care what they don't, they, they're not approval seeking or something like that. But it, it had started with, not you know I had tried to put some version of not give a fuck in there and then I I had to try to be a little more like that because in the end I couldn't fix my mistake I couldn't get forgiven and I could have not published the piece and that and that's not been attacked had another round of attacks um but if I'm really going to not give a fuck, then why would I not publish the piece? Right. But here's the so, thing, Lisa. Here's the thing. You did what you needed to do to take responsibility for what you had, the oversight you had. But at this point, it's no longer in your court. If they choose to hold yeah. on to that, that needs to be their problem. Well, that... Um, now, how do I get like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because you- Is there a you know, pill for that? <laughs> you had said in your, in your piece, you will most likely find that you no longer sweat the small stuff, except at night when you, sweat, uh -huh. when you will sweat uncontrollably, that you care less about the approval of others and feel less attached to an iteration of your life that you haven't achieved. So I yeah. think, you know, sometimes the <laughs> teacher, great. teacher, teach thyself, right? Yeah, it, but it's. I don't think that we should be looking at other women who maybe claim that they give zero fucks and assume that they don't give them all the time. I think that what progress looks like is caring about it, but maybe for a, a shorter time frame. So maybe that's how it starts. You know, in your forties and fifties, you may care, but it may last a little bit less time. Oh. Or maybe yeah. it's not as intense as it was in your 30s or 20s. So you don't have to go from caring so much and caring so much to none. It's a process. Right, right. No, that's true. I, I, I think maybe what I can aim for is recovering more quickly than I used to be able to. I, I used to, um, in my 20s, I worked at a kid's TV show and I made props. and I. I wasn't that good at it. It was a great job, but I wasn't quite talented enough. And I used to spend, you know, a couple of days making something like a, a birthday cake at a styrofoam. And then the bosses would come to review it. And they were absolutely wonderful. But I was young and I didn't know how good I had it at this job or that I would 20 years later make less money than I made at this job in 1997. Right. But, um, but the bosses would come and then they would say, um, they would tell me to redo it um, in a very nice way. I mean, they were, they were so kind. And I thought the only way to handle this is to have this combination of passion and detachment. 
So I've got to care about it while I'm doing it, but it's not mine. You know, this, this is their TV show and they got to get what they want. So I can't think like, yes, I want, yes, I want this epoxy birthday cake to look, to look like this. Um, and I used to think about that. I had a, I had formulas for a good life and one, one was passion and detachment and another one was courage and humility. Just thought like, if I could just master these combinations, I would be able to handle life. And that is what I'm working on now, being able to handle life, especially when I fuck up. Right. And I think, I mean, I love the concept of passion and detachment because we move into life and into our careers or our families or our friends, whatever it is, with so much passion. But there has to be a place where we just let go and not try to control other people and their reaction. Because that's, you know, that whole uh, quote that what other people think of you is none of your business. Just keep putting you out there into yeah. the world because yeah. for every person who gave you grief online, there are thousands who were moved and felt like you understood them, that you saw them in that piece. And that's where I feel the focus needs to be because I saw people sharing it like, this woman is in my life. How does she know what I'm going through? And so I think that's really- But of really... course, I have, to share, I have to share the credit with those women, women who uh, um, rejected me. You know, if it, if it wasn't for that post, I, I probably wouldn't. I'm not sure if I had the idea. I mean, certainly I've been thinking about that, but I, ha- I, have, I have to share the credit with them. And I, wish, and I wish I could. I wish I could be with them to do it. But you're right. I also have to let go of their- disapproval because I certainly can't get their approval. No. And, and nor, yeah. nor does that approval really matter in the long run. Yeah. So before we go, Lisa, yeah. one, one thing I ask all of my guests is what does 40 thrive mean to you? What does it mean to thrive over 40? I think it means resetting your priorities knowing what to pay attention to, getting your gratitude in check and um, letting go. I love Which, it. You know, I'm going to do, I'm going to do all of those things any minute, any <laughs> minute it's going to happen for me. <laughs> it's a process. It's not all at once. Remember okay. it's, you know, baby steps. Right. I so. agree. Baby well, steps. <laughs> well, I appreciate <laughs> you coming on and to talk about this and to be just so open. Well, thank you for letting me tell the complicated a story behind the piece. Huge thanks to Lisa Sellen Davis for sharing her story. It really is an important reminder to remember that even online, we are human beings. Can we please treat each other accordingly? Uh. Thanks so much for listening. If you like what you hear, hit the subscribe button. The podcast will appear each week on your phone, tablet, computer, without your having to do anything. And if you feel inspired, I'd love it if you'd share it with a friend. You know the one. She needs to hear that it's all going to be okay. Send her this as a little reminder. Until next time, keep thriving.